Welcome to this week's Weekly Wind-Up. My name's David Ridgway. The topics for this week's show will create some good discussions and the first topic is the Northern Powerhouse High Speed Railway 3, to give its full title, and how the delay in proving the Trans-Pennine Rail Electrification Route will affect the North and all of us living in the North. The second topic this week is something close to my heart, is the change to student grants and how this will affect future students. The guests that will discuss these topics with me are Paul Salverson, MBE for Services to the Rail Industry. He's a board member of Transport Focus, the national consumer body for rail, bus and train passengers, a visiting professor at the Huddersfield University and a member of the Hannah Mitchell Foundation. And secondly, Mike McGugan. Welcome to you, Mike, uh, as, a, as a new person on the Weekly Wind-Up, which is great to see you. Mike's the president of the Students' Union at the Huddersfield University. Uh, and we'll move straight on to the first topic. I'm sure we think we've all heard enough in the news about HS2. But what about HS3, which was pushed forward by George Osborne as the link for the Northern Powerhouse. It's been announced that the improvements to the line will be delayed and that the delay change will, and the delay will change the way we travel across the north of the country. Paul, what do you think about the delay of HS3? Well, the, there are two different things, David. And first of all, HS3 is a very long-term project which the government announced couple of years ago. What's been paused is the electrification of the Trans-Pennine route that mm. runs through our own beloved Slawit or Slathway to some people oh, prefer. And so the two are very much related but mm. one is a, a much needed short to medium term investment where we'll be able to get an improved service between Huddersfield and Manchester and also the intermediate stations. Okay. HS3 is potentially much more uh, of a major scheme really, it potentially involves an entirely new line. So what we're seeing at the moment is the, uh, these much needed improvements being paused by the government. We, we all know that within the railway industry it had run into big trouble months ago. And I think one of the things that's annoyed people is that the government kept quiet about it <laughs> before the general election. Can't imagine why, Oh dear uh, me. but uh, that seems to have been what, what's happened. But it's an opportunity to review okay. what was a, a slightly flawed scheme, actually. Paul, I want to stop us talking about this now and ask, what did the people of Huddersfield think about this? In regards to the trains, uh, they are delayed quite a lot and they don't put as many carriages on as are needed in busy, uh, busy times. So everyone's kind of cramps on the, on the train. It makes you wonder why you pay 150 quid a month for your pass. You know when they do uh, work on the lines, uh, it could be at different times. So it's not going to cause a load of delays and that. Well, I mean, the usual thing is price and, and the reliability of services. So I don't know this region very well, but I do know in other parts of the country, variable service, not enough seats, people are still paying a fortune, so it's always down to price and quality of service. Probably like less in between times and waiting times at different stations to get to Huddersfield, because especially like from Sheffield, there's like quite a long wait between the trains and it adds a lot of time onto your journeys. And then if there was possibly a faster service in that direction as well, because it takes a long time to get there. Paul, you say that we've, uh, the government's put the HS3 programme onto the back burner for specific reasons, and we'll look at that in a, in a second. Um, but do you feel that, uh, I mean, do you really feel that it would have been sensible of the government, would it have affected the result of the election if they'd told us about it before we went to vote? Who knows? I think that there's <laughs> always sensitivities. If I had been in the position of the Secretary of State, um, <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? We're both politicians, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, can you blame the guy? Uh, I think a lot of things started to become clear earlier on 
in the new year that okay. Network Rail simply wasn't able to deliver what was being expected of them. Uh, how much they knew before May the 7th, mm. maybe we'll never know. No, I don't suppose we will. Mike, you use the train from time to time, I guess, but you actually choose to drive across to Huddersfield from Blakely? Blackley? Yep. Blakely, Manchester. Blakely. Yeah, the pronunciation of these little towns and villages are really important, you know, because I live in, in the next village down from Slathwaite. <laughs> so, tell me, um, why do you choose to come by car and not by train? Um, I suppose just, just ease. Um, I live right next to the M62. Uh, it's a fairly nice drive, a beautiful drive, I must say, actually coming over the tops. Um, and, you know, there's not all the hassle of getting into town, getting the train, train potentially being delayed, getting from the station to work. Um, it's just door to door, and it, general ease, price is a lot cheaper. Um, and yeah, it would be interesting to see what the comparative delays are between road accidents on the M62 and train travel, or indeed, dare I say, snow. Yeah. Uh, because I presume if you drive across in the winter, mm -hmm. you will be held up for those two or three days when the snow is really bad. Yeah, but I, I mean, from b basic knowledge, it seems to be that the trains go before the roads do, so you can always usually you get mean about... they stop? Yeah, yeah, mm. they, yeah, they seem to... When it's the wrong kind of snow. <laughs> 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 now, that last happened on the Peniston line, but we're not here to talk about that. OK, so um, the public transport in London. I've been told that this is mainly a privatised organisation, but that's not right, is it? It's a sort of public-private no, partnership it, these days? London's transport is probably more publicly controlled, certainly publicly specified, than it is up here. Transport for London, which is accountable to Boris, the mayor, uh, is very much a public sector body, but buses and trains are provided by the private sector, but to the specification the very detailed specification of Transport for London and mm. that's a model which is certainly being looked at in the north of England and it's a model that has a lot going for it. Is it true that we're going to have old tube trains running on our railway lines in order to actually create HS3? Well again the, the two aren't directly related, uh, there's a fleet of ex-London transport tube trains are being refurbished to a very high standard, it has to be said. And again, with, with politicians, it's very easy to say, oh, well, the North's been landed with a load of second-hand rubbish <laughs> from London. But actually, let's have a look at what these vehicles are like. I'm actually going down to the West Midlands in a few weeks to see this train okay. from a, a passenger point of view, from Transport Focus. So it'd be interesting to see what sort of a job they've done. The people who are doing the work, including um, a, a Huddersfield lad, Alan Dare, who spent a lifetime in the industry. These aren't people who just think, well, you know, l l let's make a, a quick book from crap trains, basically. I think it's going to be a good quality refurbishment. The downside is that they aren't very fast. They've got acceleration, but they only run up to 60 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So th there's going to be issues, and there's going to be issues of cost. It's not going to be a cheap option. Will they have to have an electric rail running alongside the rails? These will be diesel. They're stripping the electrical equipment so out. The, the, so it's a complete refurbish. It's, it's, it's they're a, taking the it's shell a and recreating. refurb. Yeah, the new right. engines, the inside's been completely gutted. So I think it's a case of, you know, don't just assume that, you know, this is, you know, the north being shortchanged again. See what they like. When these, when these refurbished trains come through um, the tunnels at Stanage, will they be happier than when they're running out in the open? I don't know, you'll have to ask them. <laughs> you know, I think smile on the face. You know they're happy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Thomas. Yeah. But I think, you know, let, let, let's see. I think it's a sort of solution that will, if it can be delivered quickly, it might help some of the capacity problems that we've got. It's not a long term solution. I don't think okay. anyone's suggesting it is. Now, that, that's all the transport side of it, but transport is only one part of the government's um, platform with regard to the Northern Powerhouse. Mm -hmm. Um, I have to say that uh, way back in 1991, when I was selected to be a, uh, a European candidate mm -hmm. for a particular party, <laughs> I gave a speech and I was talking about um, federalism really, and the Northern Powerhouse was part of my federalist uh, proposals and it included everything 
north of Yorkshire and Lancashire up to the Scottish border plus Cheshire. Mm -hmm. So broadly speaking, without wanting to get too picky about this, it also includes what George Osborne is talking about with the Great Pinch your idea, though. Well, that's nothing new there, is yeah. it? I mean, <laughs> I mean Tories do that all the time, yeah. don't they? So. This Northern Powerhouse does interest me because mm -hmm. I do feel that in these days where we're pressing forward with devolution in, in, in discussion, but not necessarily devolution in practice, if the Northern Powerhouse is able to run its own economy, this development of HS3 and of course the upgrades that are necessary to the M62 and the rest of the motorway network, they suddenly start to become massively important, don't they? What do you think about this, Mike? I mean, obviously using the motorway in particular, I mean, although at the minute it's a bit of a burden, sometimes I've commuted across to Leeds um, and it seems to me that that, that commute is a lot it's more effective with the, the smart motorway over there mm. um, and it stops that real build-up of traffic which you see sometimes now um, between Manchester and Huddersfield. I think it, it's more effective. People want to get to places as quickly and as effective as possible. Um, don't, don't you find that a bit of a dichotomy when uh, we were told that the, the advent of the computer age would, would lessen the necessity to travel to meet people? I have to say, I like seeing people eye to eye. So with, with all this communication stuff that's going on, is the transport absolutely necessary? Paul, what do you think? Well, people have been saying for decades now that the uh, computers are going to mean we, we travel less. Actually, that hasn't happened. We, we're travelling a lot more, but we're travelling in different sort of ways. We don't travel as regularly. You know, the, you know, there's still loads of people who get the same train every morning and come back at the same time every evening but there's lots and lots of people who might travel into Leeds or Manchester or London once or twice a week. So the, the whole nature is shifting and the, the morning and evening peaks are getting longer and longer. So whenever you travel into Leeds from Huddersfield, you, you're lucky to get a seat, mm. even mm. with a very frequent train service. So there is a necessity to upgrade and to build more facility. Yeah, we need to upgrade, we need to have more capacity, that means longer trains mm. and we need to get electrification delivered as quickly as possible but to uh, the right specification which the original scheme that's been paused wasn't quite right. Weren't we supposed to have been electrified back, electrified is that the right word mm -hmm. to use? Yeah. Not, not electrocuted. <laughs> were we, weren't we supposed to have been electrified way back in the early 60s? Yeah, well, it's been talked about, you know, when, in the days of British Rail, which, you know, we'll, we'll both remember. I don't think Mike will. But, um, <laughs> still been nob as a lad then. Still but, use the uh, logo though, don't they? Yeah. It's all coming together. <laughs> there was a, what, what they called a rolling programme of electrification where you'd do one route, then you'd keep the team together and the expertise, and you'd move on to the next route. Unfortunately, in more recent times, that, that continuity has been lost. So you... you do a bit of a electrification here and there, it stops, the gangs are dissembled and then they're reformed a year or so later. So we really need to have a lot more certainty and continuity really in investing in infrastructure, same with motorways and the strategic highway network. The thing that really, I mean, we've talked about this before, Paul, in, in, in different meetings, and, and Mike, do forgive me just dropping this in, but transport is just not trains. It includes mm -hmm. buses, and I know you're interested in buses mm -hmm. too. Um, I've got my bus pass now, by the way. <laughs> look, look, great. Guys, at, guys <laughs> at 35 should not get bus passes, should they? <laughs> there you are. I know, I, I loop 35. <laughs> but um, the bus network continues to shrink. Mm. And I really do not understand why when there's this burgeoning requirement for people to travel, why the bus companies are not promoting their facilities, widening their network and encouraging people out of their cars. Mm. I just do not understand that. Can you explain that? Well, it's a puzzle when rail is doing so well. We're seeing huge growth year on year, right through the recession. Mm. Use of rail, both local and intercity, continue to grow whereas bus services have continued to decline. Uh, the place where the decline has been less is actually London, where you've got a much more managed system through the sort of franchising which Transport for London 
organise. Whereas outside of London, it's a much more chaotic system. Most services are just run on a purely commercial basis mm. with uh, a, an, an ever shrinking proportion delivered by bodies like Metro, the subsidised network. There's less and less money around in local government to support local bus services. So where you've got in some rural areas, is, it's virtually gone altogether. And it's certainly well, you could, almost, you could almost describe uh, London Transport as a nationalised transport system. I don't think they'd like that description mm. <laughs> too much. But, but uh, in comparison to what everybody mm. else has got, do you think we could run an equivalent uh, transport system up here in the north, Mike? Um, so the thing is, I mean, suppose you touched on computers before. I suppose for me, gone are the days where you live on the same street as your mum, your dad, your nan, your auntie and uncle. Mm -hmm. It's all about moving to work, moving to the cheapest place possible. So I know a lot of people who live in Huddersfield commute into Leeds and Manchester because of accommodation prices. So I suppose it, mm -hmm. within London, if you, you know if you're working in that, you want to move to the area or in in region of where you can get the cheapest accommodation. So. I mean, you can see the trend like up here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, but you can see the trend up here. I mean, mm. people even just mm. they're more flippant to just move to where the work is or within, you know, commuter spots now where people mm. live and just commute in. Well, I know that Kirklees Council has plans to make Kirklees Council within the West Yorkshire a part of this powerhouse to be the premier council to give the to, to create the situation where there'll be the best opportunity for business to move in or indeed to start and develop. Mm -hmm. And on that basis, uh, we integrate that with uh, your situation, uh, Mike, as the president of the Students' Union. You and all your colleagues in the university and in other universities elsewhere will be looking to uh, study for your degrees in a place, presumably, where you'll be inclined towards staying to live your lives. I mean, they've been safe for years, haven't they? That if you go to university in Newcastle, you never leave. Exactly. Um, which I've always thought is a bit odd, but they, I've been to Newcastle though, but it's, it's a great city. But, uh, and again, they say exactly the same about Liverpool. Mm -hmm. And if they could start saying the same about Huddersfield, we, the, the, the greater uh, a part of, of the Huddersfield community, mm -hmm. have got to deliver to you the opportunities to have a career, to have uh, to have the work there, and so on and so forth. But isn't that going to cut the necessity for transport? No, it I don't might think increase I, the amount for buses. I don't think it will. It's cut about making examples. places attractive to to live and to I develop agree. your career. I and I think more and more students do seem to be staying in Huddersfield. You know, so anecdotally, I bump into them in. Uh, various bars <laughs> and I think that's one of the things that, that I know we're straying away from transport now but you've got a really vibrant pub club and bar culture in, in Huddersfield we've got some good eating places and indeed so, on the ale trail don't mention the ale oh, trail sorry don't mention the ale trail okay fine right well, well our it's, second it's topic going after so the well when you mention the <laughs> <laughs> our second topic after the break will be student grants and I know that I shall come in for a certain amount of brick bat on that so we're now going to take a break. The weekly wind-up can be contacted by email at info at kirkleyslocaltv.com or on Twitter at The Weekly Wind-Up. And we are indeed to be found on Facebook. All of these things which I find very confusing in this modern age. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. However large, or small your business. Attracting new customers requires dedication and a lot of patience. Just like fishing, but you also need the right gear. Rods, reels, lines, hooks, sinkers, lures, tackle box, tackle bag, net, bait, gas gloves, clothes, and pocket knife lunch. Or you could simply advertise with KLTV. Online, grow your business and your clientele. KLTV, your vision made reality. Should have gone to KLTV. Welcome back to today's show. Before we discuss our next topic, let's have some more news from our local area. Still on the tropic of trains, it was reported in the Examiner 
on the 20th of July 2015 that a model railway club has sounded its horn for new members. The Pennine Model Railway Society is on the lookout for younger generations to join the ranks and to discover the fascinating world of miniature railway building. Graham Royston said, We build railways from small end gauge size to the popular Hornby size and even bigger. Some of the ones we have had at the moment include a Wild West themed railway and one that looks like it's based on an old grimy Yorkshire town. Uh, the club will host an open day on the 1st of August at St Philip's Community Centre on Browlin Road where visitors will be able to have a go with the model railways themselves. Mike, you're the president of the Students' Union and students have been in the news now for five years and a bit on the basis that, uh, if I can put it this way, five years ago in 2010, some students uh, got Nick Clegg in a corner and tied him up to <laughs> making a promise that if he got into government, which would have been a big surprise at that stage, that he would deliver free student fees. And then um, he got into government and immediately cancelled the programme. Um, I think that's a good starting point. What do you think about that? Um, I suppose I'll reserve my opinions on <laughs> Nick Clegg on that one. <laughs> I would support the... I mean, I think, to be fair, students do feel unjust. They felt like... I mean, in, in the 2010 election, the Lib Dems and Nick Clegg were the party to back if you're a student. You know, they, they, they put their hat out and they said, you know what, if we get in, we're gonna, they, they, we will cut fees. And you know what, and, and, and to target in such a vulnerable age, which is students, I mean, you'd sometimes 18, 19, just your first vote. I mean, I was one of those. <laughs> and I would generally believed that Nick Clegg could have went in and done that. And I'm sure they didn't hold him up because he held that picture up himself where he said, I will, you know, back the cutting of fees. So, but he went in. And I, I understand that he, he probably had a lot of. Um, he didn't have a full majority of himself, and it's a difficult decision when you're in there. But the NUS did an excellent campaign, and the last thing, you know, one of the better things the NUS have done in the past few years, where on his on the recent 2015 general election, you know, paraded, you know, the bite back as it were, <laughs> so giving it a bit back, which is really nice to see students in a right way, pushing the message of. You know, if if you're going to promise us something, deliver it. And I think they're a loud voice of students. So it's a very strange thing, you know, that um, free student education, as far as I'm aware, has never actually been on the political agenda for the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. And yet, Mr. Miliband did say we would um, free up six thousand pounds per annum for students, and yet it mattered not one jot. Whereas Nick Clegg, um, for all his, uh, to put words into your mouth, which is my prerogative, uh, for, for all his vault fast, uh, it is still uh, on the agenda, as far as I understand, of the Lib Dem um, uh, long-term policy to create um, a situation where students get their education based on the state. And I think that's good and honest um, politics on the basis that it is society's investment in this country, in the education of the people in this country, in order to achieve the best out of your generation to look after our generation. And then when your generation becomes our generation, it's the best thing that your generation can then do to look after your generation with the one that's coming in behind. And until we get a long-term process of understanding the economics behind all this, it's just going to be a political football. I don't think politics should enter into education at all anyway. So there you are, that's my neck on the block. What do you think of that? Um, no, I understand where you're coming from, but I mean, these are the people who are running our country. And if, they are. if you look at any market research, the proudest thing what people from Britain are proud of is our education system. Correct. People come from all over the world just to come to one of our universities. And, and so be it, we're we a great country for you know, our, our education. And it depends how you look at it. Because, I mean, we, we have students who don't clearly understand that when the fees went up, 
that it was the government's doing. I mean, some students still believe that it's universities trying to make more money now. So, and but now we're in a position where at university, it's three times the fees, three times the expectation. So students are wanting a lot more for what uh, and the bang for the buck. And fortunately, we're in an excellent place in Huddersfield. It's a great university, debt free. But not everyone can say that. I mean, and you have to go up with the fees because look at what happened to Leeds Met. Yeah. And they didn't. Yeah, <laughs> and absolutely still, right. They're still recouping that now. Well, let's just listen to what some of the, the public had to say about this. Uh, we asked members of the public to give us their views on student fees and uh, not going to university because of the costs involved. I just missed out on the cost rise. And I think if it had gone up, I would have thought a lot more about going. I don't think I would have been as tempted at all. And I think like the numbers sort of dropped a bit and people being interested. I think that it should be like the, the threshold for having to repay the loan should be raised and there should be a condition whereby they have to be consistently earning X amount of money for a certain period of time so that you know they are on the feet and they are you know they have got the routine and stuff settled once they get out and they need to put more work experience on the on the university courses for degrees as well. You don't have to pay it back until you're earning a certain amount of money so it's not too bad. I'm sure that does weigh in their decisions so I mean a lot of students these days are choosing financial options which means staying at home, stay at home, no travel and it's a missed opportunity in my opinion. So Mike tell me um, how do you go about repaying these uh, loans, which these fees are going to be converted into by, I gather, the new government diktat? How are you going to repay all these loans into the future? I mean, yeah, the way that, I mean, the thing which has come out recently is, is the maintenance grant. So, I mean, this is purely based on you've got your loans, which is £9,000, ridiculous if you ask me. However, now it's now the maintenance grant, which was usually about two and a half, three thousand pound, which is basically your food, you know, how you live, and sometimes comes to subsidise a lot of your rent. So, I mean, think about that and what what pe who would get that? I mean, fifty percent of students in our university to obtain that grant, and now they're going to have to pay that back. So you're talking twelve thousand pounds before you've even started now. That's is, a year, of course. Yeah, per year, yeah. Mm. Is this going to affect? Um, <coughs> such things as um, the devolution to the Northern Powerhouse? I think it will have an impact. I, I think, to me, I, I went to Lancaster University back in <coughs> 1971, and those were the days when you, you got a, a grant, you could live on it. You know, it wasn't that, we didn't think it was that generous at the time, but looking back, it, it certainly <coughs> was. But if I'd have thought, well, I'm going to go to university, and then I'll have you know, the equivalent of 12,000 a year to pay back. I just wouldn't have done it. And I think a lot of working class students, is, I think it's partly cultural, even though you know, the government's saying, well, you know, it's, it's relatively easy to pay back and it's only there's a certain threshold. <coughs> I still think there is a, an ethos that a lot of people from traditional working class background, and not just white, I think probably in Asian communities as well, really don't like the idea of going into such debt so it's a massive deterrent and that will impact on the northern powerhouse if, we, if we're not creating a new generation of sort of dynamic well-educated young people what price you know than powerhouse it isn't going to happen has there been an effect on the number of students <coughs> coming in each year i suppose one of the things well no for us um, as a university, we've seen rises because one of the things I think a lot of people do share the opinion of is that it would affect the working class. Now, I think coming from that background and the 9,000 fees, I mean, there's no way of paying that back. <laughs> the, that money is just not going to be paid back. And I think a working class student would just think it's almost fake debt and I won't ever have to really pay that back. <coughs> However, the, the, the people we have seen not coming to university are the people, the, I say the middle class students whose parents would have usually paid. Mm -hmm. So you, they could afford the £3,000, however this £9,000 deterring them from coming. So it's, it's an odd mm -hmm. thing, however the maintenance grant being cut, I think we will see a knock on effect to that now. Mm. You've not heard of any knock on effect as yet though? Uh, no. no. <coughs> uh, I, I, I fear that you're right. Mm. Um, and I, I, I do have to say that there are balances here that um, 
I, I know <coughs> it was Tony Blair's dream to give every child coming through the educational system the opportunity to go on to university. <coughs> I don't actually share that dream. I don't think university education is the right thing for everybody. I think a <coughs> university education should be a matter of, a, of availability for everybody who wants to seek it. And that's not quite the same ambition. No, I think it is about having the opportunity to go yeah. to university. And I, I totally agree. It's not the be all and end all. My nephew, very, very highly talented young engineer, but absolutely not academic in any sense. So he's actually built a great career because he, he was lucky, he fell on his feet, he got an apprenticeship, he's working all over the world now, earning far more money than I ever did. <laughs> Good luck to him. But, uh, you know, it wasn't based on going to university, but I think we do need to have good quality vocational education, uh, universities, but also you know, the old polytechnic yep. ideal, if you like, you know, get yep. your hands dirty and really developing <coughs> high level skills. Mike, do you think that students in the future are going to be happy in being treated as customers rather than pupils? I mean, it's a tough one. It's a tough question because, I mean, where do you draw the line with that? So, your <laughs> student handbook and regulations, is that then a terms and conditions where you just tick, Absolutely. you know, like purchasing yeah. something? Um, I mean, and, and, and it's difficult because, I mean, universities, although you have, for example, attendance monitoring, so, I mean, anything where you'd consume, so, for example, at like the gym or something, if you didn't go, then that's fine, that's your prerogative. However, in a lot of universities, due to our high influx of international students, you almost have to attend. So it's odd, so, and if you don't attend, you're being charged, you're fined. <laughs> so, I mean, it's an odd situation and it, it's so difficult. I mean, I, I'm not sure as to where... Where, where that lies leaves us with students. Would, would students come out the better for it? Potentially, but we're just going to have to see. I think that's a... With what, with what the CMA are Im implementing on, or advising but universities to do. There are so many different triangles which need to be closed, aren't there? Yeah. So many. And I do think that rather than closing them, we seem to be breaking more and more open, which, is, which isn't good for yeah, the future. Yeah, I think it's... Well, I don't know. I think it's a good thing that, that students have more control over what they do back in my day it was uh, well i understand uh, you were completely out of control well uh, yeah, exactly if we didn't <laughs> like it we, we'd just go for the nuclear option and, and occupy the senate building which well, there you are. happened within four weeks of me starting at lancaster <laughs> university <laughs> right um thank you very much both of you for b both those uh, those comments that you've made i mm. found that really interesting i hope you've not thought that i've talked too much but everybody else seems to do so I'm Might going to talk. Habits of a lifetime. Well, so <laughs> tell, tell me about it, Paul. Tell me about it. I'm going to talk now about uh, Jason Allen. Have you seen this in the paper about Jason Ooh. Allen? Placard man. He's been bombarded with job offers after appealing for work via a sign at Aspley. Uh, he's been jobless for some time and he spent days appealing for work at the roadside and he'll soon be replacing his handmade placard with a job. He's so far received 15 offers of work and has also had a few more unusual propositions, including a marriage proposal. I've had a lot of good offers, he says, and I've got three interviews lined up for Monday morning. I hope those are job offers and not marriage offers, and quite a few other offers that I need to follow up. Jason captured the attention of the members of the public with his handwritten cardboard sign with the words, looking for work, do any type of job. So, remember, the Weekly Wind-Up can be contacted by email at info at kirklyslocaltv.com or on Twitter at The Weekly Wind-Up. And we're also available on Facebook. Thanks very much, Mike, for coming in from the Students' Union. It's been great to meet you. All, all power to your elbow, and I hope you really do achieve all those things you want to do in this current year. And, Paul, nice to see you again. Good to see you, after all these oh, After all these weeks. weeks. Thank you both for coming in. It's been great to see you. Thanks for watching. See you next week.